uh, on a very rare tumor, it's medulloblastoma. And I will focus on medulloblastomas in adults because I'm an adult neuro-oncologist and I would like to provide you with some information on this rare tumor and some outlook on possible future man management. So maybe if we go back to the basics a little bit, um, you might remember that medulloblastoma is a malignant and small and blue tumor cell tumor of the cerebellum, which makes accordingly cerebellar symptoms. Um, with a very low incidence. So what you can see here is what the incidence peak is around five years and very few patients are above 16 years or are even adults coming up to about 450 new cases per year in Europe and maybe the, the same numbers in the United States. So, so you can imagine what even in a, a referral center like ours we see maybe one or two patients with a first diagnosis per year and maybe up to 10 patients with a relapse um, diagnosis or referred patients which are asked for a second opinion here. Um, you have the macroscopic picture here. You see that the tumor is situated in the cerebellum and you can also see within the MRI you have a large tumor mass. In a sketch down here you can see uh, where the tumors can be in the midline or in the cerebral hemispheres. They can invade into the brain stem. And as you can uh, see with the colors there, the red, the blue, yellow, and, and green one, there are different groups, subgroups of metodoplastomas, which becomes very interesting later on because one of these subgroups is um, amenable for a targeted therapeutic strategy. So what neuropathologists did, we uh, graded these tumors according to immunohistochemistry, chemistry. And you can see here that um, there's still some, uh, there's already some subgrouping with the uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry in the wind, the sonic hedgehog and the non-wind, non sonic hedgehog tumors. And as a neuro neuropathologist, you will have um, antibodies to, to stand these tumors and to classify them into with four distinct subgroups. Now, as diagnosis advances, we have high throughput methods. Um, for example, the 850K methylation array shown here. And what you can see here is that you can cluster many brain tumors, what's all brain tumors, into specific methylation groups. And if you just pick out here the middle blastomas and switch it back and forth for some time, so you can see what the medulloblastomas here in the subgroups again, wind, group three, group four, and sonic catcher cluster nicely together. So you can dissociate them just based on this 850K methylation array. And you get a lot of information by your classification from uh, such uh, high throughput approaches. Now things become pretty complicated because the histological matching on the left side here doesn't fully overlap with the genetic matching. So if you have one of your four genetic subgroups that doesn't match with the classical histological groups, um, which makes things complicated. And you can see down here on the left side, we have what you have a lot of um, antigens which are spread over these tumor subgroups. You have cytogenetic aberrations, recurrent mutations, and so on which brings you to the fact that um, these subclassifications are not only important for classification, but also for the def uh, definition of potential um, targeted therapies. On the right side, you can see that there have been additional subgroups defined, for example, for group C4. Here in the lower part, you can see there are already eight additional sub subgroups for these groups. And for the sonic hedgehog group, which is uh, the most important one, because that is the one which is most prominent in adults, most prevalent in adults, and which can be targeted, you can see that this one has al already been divided into four subgroups. And what is important is that all these sub-subgroups associate with certain features in the patients. So for example, with age, you have adult patients almost exclusively in the sonic, sonic hedgehog delta subgroup with certain histologies, for example, the desmoplastic one, we have uh, distinct rates of metastasis um, starting from 8.9% up to 34%, depending on the subgroups, and we associate with distinct survivors, which shows us that um, subgrouping really has clinical impact and is just not just a, a scientific approach. 
Um, one uh, or two additional points which are important to know. The first one is what uh, each metalloblastoma is very homogeneous within the tumor, so you don't have such a high heterogeneity as in gliomas. Um, with, for example, here are um, single cells evaluated from, from single patients. And for example, in the metalloblastoma 7, you can see that all the cell, cells from the tumor come from the same class, from the sonic hedgehog subclass. However, we have a lot of somatic alterations. And if you specifically look, look down here for the copy number alterations, you can see that within the tumors, you have heterogeneity of somatic alterations, which later on comes to the point where there might be different driver um, genetic events in, in, in the same tumor. And if you try to model now what happens in between the first line therapy and relapse, you can see that there is a genetic evolution in, in, into these tumors. On the left side, where it's um, an animal model uh, with a primary in red, with the metastatic recurrence in blue and the local recurrence in green. And you see here with the very small overlap in, in between the first line and the metastatic or recurrent situation, but the first line tumor doesn't have so much to do with the relapsed tumor. So if you want to go for targeted therapies, you should try to get a biopsy again in relapse to get a spe specific genetic um, information on that. And another complicated uh, image on the right side here, which shows basically what of the mutations are shared in between the primary and the recurrent tumor and which mutations are not shared. And you can see, for example, here in the green group, which is group four, there's a lot of shared mutations, the yellow ones here in the middle. But in other subgroups, like in the sonic hedgehog, you have many recurrent specific mutations, bringing us again to the fact that you should analyze your relapsed tumor if you're approaching targeted therapies. So why is it interesting um, to, to look specifically on metulloblastoma in adults? Um, biology is different. Um, the tumor has a high relevance for the affected patients with, uh, who are in the middle of the age, middle of professional and, and private lives, has also relevance for the society. So it would be good if we could treat these tumors better. And it has relevance for the scientific community because we don't have many prospective data, um, at least no prospective therapeutic data on adults with metulloblastoma. The classical approach is the chemotherapy approach, which you now might know from the uh, children uh, who are treated for metulloblastoma. And there are basically two regimens. The first one is the PECA one with radiochemotherapy with CCNU or lom lomustine, cisplatin, and vincristine. And the other one is the Taylor one, which uses carboplatin uh, and cyclophosphamide plus etoposide and vincristium. Uh, the PECA one with radiotherapy up front and the Taylor one with chemotherapy uh, up front followed by radiotherapy. The beta, da beta data sets come from, for adults come from the PECA regimen. So we have um, at least some publications with adult subsets. Um, leading us to the, yeah, to the knowledge that the four-year event-free survival in adults is around 75%, and the overall survival is pretty good, around 90%. However, there's a big dissection in between the molecular subgroups I showed you before. So you saw it's small data sets in adults, and uh, some people approach to do larger analysis, which are retrospective. The left one um, just compiled about 500 um, patients from the National Cancer Database of the UK, and we compared adjuvant radiotherapy against um, adjuvant radiochemotherapy, which fares much better in this analysis. And the other one from Cox, uh, Kochakaya uh, also shows that the chemotherapy, either neoadjuvant or adjuvant, is um, better than a radiotherapy alone, which partly solves the question if uh, radiochemotherapy or just radiotherapy should be applied in adults. But it's all um, large cohorts, retrospective, no prospective data um, up to this point. Uh, the German NOAA did um, the evaluation of the PECA regimen for adults with the primary goal of toxicity and feasibility. Um, I showed you the regimen before, radiotherapy followed by cysteinosis, platinum, and vincristine. And the most important point here on the left side is what adults don't do much more than six 
maintenance chemotherapy cycles because after that we get severe side effects. So after cycle six, 56.7% of the patients dropped out of the chemotherapy, which is a difference to children. And the other important information on the right side was wait the time interval is often pretty uh, long between resection and start of ready chemotherapy. Um, 53 days here in median, which brings us to the fact that the, um, that the therapy should be well coordinated in the adult patients. So what is the current status for a, a kind of um, a treatment recommendation? Everything deduced from pediatric data and from experience. Uh, it would be important that you state your patient um, with a, a, a tight preoperative workup. You do an MRI of brain and spine, uh, look for the cerebrospinal fluid, um, do your histological and molecular assignment to the relevant WHO classification group. Um, after that, you approach cross total resection. If you can do it, you do partial resection for your histology and approach a panel decision for further treatment. And now you have intermediate risk patients with small tumors. Uh, with no dissemination or just uh, CSF dissemination and um, the winter and the catch molecular subgroups uh, with an intermediate risk and you do with these patients a standard craniospinal radiotherapy um, plus minus chemotherapy and plus a post-radiation maintenance chemotherapy but the database is not very hard here for the high-risk patients with larger tumors with more than M M1 metastatic disease you go for a standard dose craniospinal radiotherapy and you go for radiochemotherapy in each case. And after that, you do a follow up, which should be continued for long periods because adults tend to relapse late in comparison to children who almost always relapse within the first five years of the diagnosis. Now, I talked a lot about possible um, approaches um, to. Um, to include molecular information in your treatment strategy. And what is very interesting is that the sonic hedgehog subgroup of metalloblastoma is prevalent or is targetable because you have a well-defined pathway with the sonic hedgehog pathway and you have specific inhibitors, the smoothened inhibitors, which can block this um, driver pathways in these tumors. And the smart thing is that 70% of adults are, sonic are in the sonic hedgehog group. So you can treat 70% of the adults with your targeted approach. And with adults don't have, almost never have downstream mutations in the, in the sonic hedgehog pathway. So if your targeted pathway uh, in its upper part, the treatment should work. And this can be nicely modeled here. Um, if you just focus maybe on the middle upper part here, you can see um, if you treat vehicle against uh, a smoothened inhibitor, you can nicely down-regulate all your targets in the, in the pathway. You can, can also nicely regulate your tumor volume here on the right upper part. And you see if you treat, the tumor shrinks. If you don't treat, the tumor grows. If you treat again, the tumor shrinks up to a point where the tumor relapses because some kind of resistance um, uh, occurs. And down here, you can also see an intracranial model with uh, untreated um, uh, mice against cisplatin and the red one are the smooth and treated ones. So it's pretty nice um, effects in the animal model. And you have similar effects in patients. You can see here a, a patient uh, who was treated with a smooth and inhibitor, but you also can see that these patients relapse because they develop secondary resistance against these treatments. Now, there are two main substances with uh, sonidigib and, uh, um, um, and wismodigib, which have been treated in clinical trials in adults and in children. And you can see here that in comparison to standard therapy, sonidigib as well as wismodigib have a tendency to, uh, to improve the hazard ratios for relapse and death. And a direct comparison of um, of sonidigib against wismodigib, wismodigib on the left and sonidigib on the right shows that sonidigib might be more effective at least in children, but also in adults in a small population. But there is uh, really some, some hint that it really works in the patients. 
So in the last part, uh, just some words to a clinical trial we are just um, setting up now and which will start in late summer of this year. It's a ERTC trial which will include adult patients with medulloblastoma with the primary goal to compare the progression-free survival uh, between a standard therapy and the experiment, experimental therapy um, with sonidegib, one of the smoothened inhibitors in sonic dependent patients. Um, study was powered for the sonic hedgehog subgroup because MIS, as I said, is 70% of the adult population. And there are some other um, endpoints, including quality of life, neurocognitive function, fertility outcomes, endocrine function, and uh, some other translational endpoints. Uh, eligibility will be all patients, um, adult patients in all the subgroup, and um, um, adolescent patients from age 15 or 16 in the sonic hedgehog subgroup because the pediatricians found it very attractive why sonic gib is used in this patient in the sonic hedgehog subgroup. That's the pretty complicated design of the trial, but the basic thing is that in the sonic hedgehog patients will be evaluated, um, will be stratified into the sonic hedgehog subgroup if we are sonic hedgehog, and will be then randomized against standard therapy or the standard therapy plus sonic gibbs so Catchock um, inhibitor, and there will be a second um, um, randomization in, in between a higher dose radiotherapy, neuroaxis radiotherapy against the lower dose, which will be done for all the three molecular subgroups. So that's the basic um, design. And this is all the translational research which will be done within the trials. So we will con con collect tumor tissue, we will collect also CSF of the patients. We will collect the MRI images, radiotherapy plans, and will all these things evaluate centrally to better understand uh, what patients respond to the treatment, where the resistance is, and if CSF is suited to predict um, response and resistance in these patients. It's up to 205 patients we want to include into this trial, which makes it a pan-European approach. Australia is also involved. And the setup, as I said, is pretty um, pretty uh, finalized, and we will have the first site open end of July, July or not August 2021, and hope to include as many patients as possible in Europe and in Australia. So thanks to everybody who is involved in that trial, and thanks for listening. If you should have questions which, which you'd like to um, to write, you can use this email address, address uh, left down here. And I'm happy to answer all questions which uh, which uh, which reach me.